Okay, for those of you listening in on uh, Ustream, uh, I know we have two talks left. Uh, I finish out the directorate and then, uh, and then we'll have a talk on our southern office, but then uh, about 15 minutes after that, uh, Chad Merkin will be giving his uh, lecture and uh, we're going to stream it. So if you're uh, interested in that, then you can uh, hang out or come back and and listen to the talk. Yeah. Okay. All right, the next uh, speaker is myself. So I guess I won't introduce myself that way, but uh, I'm uh, Hugh DeLong, and I am the last director of uh, Math, Information, and Life Sciences. And my, my uh, program is Natural Materials, Systems, and uh, Extreme Files. You know, this is March 6th, I guess, and I was thinking about that. You know, 10 years ago, I was actually uh, on the faculty at the Naval Academy. I haven't, I haven't uh, quite got to the 10-year to the mark. It's next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is my portfolio. And I also realized that uh, uh, within that almost 10 years, I don't have a single PI uh, still in the program from that first day I started. And uh, <laughs> is that what it was? <laughs> Worked them to death? Some of them might say that. My old director might have said that. But uh, actually, uh, the oldest uh, part of my portfolio is actually under the, uh, the biomimetics and, um, and it's actually the chromophores. Uh, even though none of the PIs that are funded now were funded back then, uh, uh, Morley Stone was actually in the lab and he was my first lab program. And uh, uh, Morley and I sat down and uh, we had a meeting and, and decided we were gonna clean house on the chromophores and so we ended up uh, getting rid of everybody that was in the program and starting over. And <laughs> no, not morally. <laughs> but it did make a change, and I think it was a change for the better. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is a brief description of the portfolio. Um, uh, the goals of the program, study, use, mimic, uh, or alter how biological systems accomplish. Uh, a desired task, obviously from, I say our, but it's, I guess it's my point of view. And, uh, uh, enable them to task specifically produce natural materials and systems. And uh, this program has as its sub areas biomimetics, biomaterials, biointerfacial sciences, and extreme files, uh, although throughout all of them, all the areas tend to have a, uh, a biomaterials uh, uh, bent to them. Okay. And so this is the. Uh, this is the program vision. And so we obviously want to mimic these systems, but you know, we're willing to use them as well. I mean, if, if the uh, material exists in the biological world and it's usable for what we want to use it for, uh, like I gave the example, I remember at uh, NRL they were using uh, uh, viral protein coats for uh, optical films. Uh, then, then we are interested in that as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be something that we're mimicking. Uh, but we're also looking at using the organisms for precise control because we have interests in, in shape and, uh, and function. And so uh, uh, I like to separate this into three uh, separate parts to this vision. The first is protecting human assets, uh, enhancing materials performance is a second, and third is, is uh, enhancing uh, uh, system operation. And so uh, the, the protecting human assets parts uh, over, the, uh, over the decade have tended to look at uh, chem bio threats. Um, we have had some of those uh, systems that we looked at uh, result in other uses. For instance, we were looking at uh, 
the DNA from various uh, pathogenic organisms uh, that we were trying to detect, and the system that the PI came up with eventually ended up uh, going into two different systems. One of them was uh, looking at uh, the water supply. Uh, Homeland Security actually picked that up and funded it as an applied project and, and uh, actually did some testing eventually in some of the public uh, uh, water areas. Uh, they never told us which places they actually placed the units. But, uh, and then another one was uh, uh, they actually used it as a diagnostic uh, test for, um, I think it was uh, uh, Coumadin and uh, Wolfram, I guess is another name for it. Anyway, uh, for a blood thinner. And uh, uh, he ended up eventually starting a company and, uh, and the company marketed the thing uh, uh, and uh, got FDA approval and it became the first FDA approved uh, diagnostic test uh, that was from uh, bio-nanotechnology. And so, uh, uh, so that was a, sort of a, you know, something that came out of it that sort of was, you know, off the beaten path, so to speak. Uh, the materials performance, uh, let's see, what was the one I was thinking of? Oh yeah, they've, we had some of our uh, uh, materials move into the Air Force Research Lab and became uh, uh, optical films, it became optical limiters, lenses. Uh, so some of those materials have moved in and then in the, uh, in the uh, system operation, uh, let's see, oh, that was the thermal sensors. That was the oldest program in this program, thermal sensors, but I don't have anything in thermal sensors anymore. We ended up studying the thermal sensors in uh, snakes and, uh, and beetles. Some of these beetles use them, they're along the thorax, and, and they're taking essentially temperature measurements so that when they land on freshly burned wood, they don't go up like a torch. They, uh, they can find the hot spots so they can lay their eggs and be the first in there so there's no other uh, parasites there to destroy their eggs. And uh, we ended up uh, uh, bringing that into the lab. The lab made an um, a, uh, array out of it, and uh, uh, DARPA ended up contributing to the program and eventually became an uh, a, uh, uh, image array. And they used a, a video camera to actually monitor infrared signatures. So it was, it was actually pretty interesting. So anyway. So these are the program trends. This last year was pretty static. Uh, all the areas pretty much stayed the same, uh, except for uh, uh, the biomolecular assembly. I, I ended up with a new MURI in that, and you're going to hear about uh, some new initial results, because they're so cool. I had to show them to you. They're new. And, uh, and then a new BRI. You heard about the BRI program. And uh, I have one in. Uh, uh, bio nano combinatorics, and I, I do that in conjunction with, uh, with the optimization program. And uh, we're just now going through proposals and, uh, and making selections for funding. So, so that's a totally, totally new program from the rest. And so here's the chromophores. Uh, it's tied in with the uh, BioX XTT. Uh, that's a cross directorate program between different, uh, different directorates in AFRL. And uh, one of the discoveries actually was a new GFP that has very high quantum efficiency, in fact, the highest ever found. And uh, it's now used in AFRL's TDs and their programs. Uh, it's used in uh, Navy labs now, and uh, several of my uh, university PIs have picked it up. It's actually amazing how bright it is, because uh, when uh, RH was using it for their, uh, for their lab uh, task, they had to grind up the cells in order to, f to figure out where the reporter was. And now, I just visited them recently, and uh, they have it in the cells. They don't take it out of the cells. They can make the measurements right through the cells. It's, it's actually shining up uh, on the Petri dish, so you're getting reflection off the cover of the Petri dish when you, uh, when you put this uh, in there, so it's pretty bright. Uh, bio, bio camouflage is a uh, PVD 709 program, and so uh, we're looking at all aspects of that. Uh, we do not uh, look at the vision aspect of that, uh, just how it works. So we're looking at mechanisms. Uh, structural coloration is a new area. 
that I funded, and uh, I have several PIs that have been moving in and out. That usually happens when I start a new area because some things work out, some things don't. And so uh, uh, this last year, I actually, even though it's constant, it sort of wasn't. <laughs> some left and some ended up coming in. Uh, biopolymers has mainly been silk and elastin. Uh, it also included the last year uh, um, cellulose as well. Uh, biomolecular assembly, I already mentioned that one. Peptide mediated material synthesis, we're trying to determine how materials grow on peptides and proteins and hopefully get to a predictive state that'll be down the road. And then the extremophile survival, we're trying to get mechanisms from extremophiles and incorporate them into other systems to try to make our sensors last longer. Okay, these are areas that are being funded uh, and what others are doing. I have two grants right now in chromophores. Uh, most of the work that's out there with other organizations is almost all on reporter technology. Uh, we're interested in looking at wavelength intensity and lifetime as pertains to the, uh, the BioX program. Uh, Silk, uh, DARPA's actually contributed to my program to look at some uh, applications from some of the outcomes of the Silk. Uh, ARO has a grantee, uh, ONR actually has an investigator in this, and NSF has several single investigator grants, no coherent program. Uh, structural coloration, biocamouflage, ONR has a MIRI on this focused on vision. Uh, and I actually have a MIRI too, but mine's not focused on the vision aspect. It's actually focused on the, uh, the structural coloration elements itself. Uh, ARO has a grant with one of their ICB PIs as a separate grant outside of the ICB. And uh, in case you guys don't know, that's the, that uh, Institute for Collaborative Biotechnology that they have at uh, UC Santa Barbara. And then um, uh, NSF has single investigator grants. Uh, I would say that the area that I work in most that uh, has a complement out there in the other agencies is the biomolecular assembly. A number of organizations actually are in that area. So we're focused on soft lithography and uh, peptide binding and cell or directed assembly. And in fact, uh, uh, you'll be hearing about some of the soft lithography from Chad Merkin's talk uh, later today. And then uh, finally, the extreme files. NASA has been involved in this on the origins of life uh, and also uh, exobiology as far as life on other planets. Uh, our focus is on radiation protection mechanisms and then also trying to take some of these uh, resistive mechanisms and move them into other systems. ARO is actually focused on spore formers. Okay, the first area is biomimetics. And uh, we're looking at principles, processes, and designs. We're looking at manipulating the sensors and uh, doing some mimicking of the sensor denial system. Uh, sometimes we mimic, sometimes we just take the whole sensor. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at mimicking sensor motifs from animals. Uh, we're looking at self-healing, sensing, sort of skin-like uh, ability. I've been doing this uh, over the years with uh, Les Lee and he's in the um, uh, uh, RSA directorate. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer. And then also understanding complex nature of predator-prey avoidance, so uh, that's where all the camouflage is. And the reason we look at this is, of course, sensitivity. Uh, these uh, biosystems are extremely sensitive, as Willard mentioned. And the other advantage they have is they work in cluttered environments, so they're very noisy, yet they're still able to do it and realize that they have a very limited palette as far as uh, what chemistries they're using, and uh, they do it all at room temperature, which is uh, very important. Uh, Self-healing and then stealth as well. Okay, so the first uh, science area is, uh, I decided to pick this one because uh, this is a effort that I'm actually funding overseas. This is at the University of Exeter and it's in the UK, and he's working with my Murray at Harvard. And uh, it turns out that he's become uh, a critical component of that Murray, and so uh, he's, he's so tied in now with all the other uh, personnel in that Murray, I don't know what they do without him. Uh, he's looking at uh, beetles is the main thing, sometimes butterflies, 
and he's trying to understand uh, how they go about getting color in these systems. Um, but I, I didn't put either one of those up on this slide. Actually, what happened was a colleague of his gave him this seed pod and said that he ought to look at this. And he opened the seed pod, and the seed inside had this really nice uh, blue color in it. And so upon examining the seed, he found that the seed is actually not doing this by pigment. It's actually, again, structural coloration. And so it turns out that it has these structures that look like jelly rolls, and they're sort of uh, lumped together. So there's, there's one right next to it, one right next to it there. And they're all uh, tied together. And then when you, when you look at these individual jelly rolls, you can see that they're all uh, neatly ordered throughout the system. And so uh, he worked with Harvard to actually make an artificial counterpart of this so he could study it. And uh, you can see that running light through it did create the blue color that's fairly uh, similar to the, to the seed pod. And so uh, one of the things he's interested in is the interplay of the, of the hierarchical structures that you see in these, uh, in these um, uh, uh, organisms, or in this case, uh, plant seeds, uh, at different link scales. And uh, as it turns out, uh, you get the same type of effect in uh, say butterflies, here you can see green here amongst the black, and that green is actually made from these, uh, uh, essentially these scales, and these scales are pretty small, this, is, this, this bar is 20 microns, and uh, uh, so he opens up one of these scales, which is right here, and you can see the uh, structure within the scale. This almost looks like a uh, uh, honeycomb, but sort of in a quasi-ordered fashion. Turns out it works better in a quasi-ordered than a, than a straight-ordered fashion. And then you have these ridges that are actually formed on top. And so he's actually uh, removed the membrane in this one and then removed the honeycomb so you can <coughs> study these ridges as well as the photonic uh, polycrystal here. And the whole point is to, to look at this to model it, and they use uh, fi my, uh, finite element of, uh, mental analysis on the polycrystal to determine what the structure is here. But the other thing he does, and uh, this is the only reason really to, I wanted to bring this up because this isn't actually finished yet, is that, is that they're actually making uh, 3D model physical fabrication of these structures. And so because everybody knows Maxwell's equations are scalable, uh, you can actually make these structures bigger than what they originally were and then study them with uh, electromagnetic radiation just by, just by increasing the wavelength. So, uh, so he's made a number of structures where he's now looking at them with uh, microwaves and looking at the impact of microwaves on them. Uh, so you use uh, stereolithography and uh, you can get a resolution of roughly 50 microns on this and uh, I guess it didn't turn out that well. You could see there, there's there's definite wavy structure to this. I know on his slide it actually says potential for metals and stretchable materials, but he's actually uh, got a flexible material already made now. Uh, but uh, this he's doing in conjunction with uh, Harvard, and in fact he was doing some of this at Exeter, but now Harvard, uh, that technology has been transitioned and Harvard's able to make these now with their structures as well. Okay, moving on to natural materials. That's the biomaterials uh, section. In this case, we're either mimicking the natural material, we're using an organism to produce them, sort of like a factory, or uh, you just using the natural material itself. Um, I always think in terms of uh, uh, silk could actually fall into this area where we're using the silk as the native material. It could also fall into this area because we're uh, taking the gene and transferring it to uh, E. coli and then producing uh, uh, silk from the E. coli. So uh, you can think of it as either one of those. Uh, we like materials that can withstand uh, extreme environments. And in fact, we even, uh, when uh, OSR was involved in MISI 6, we actually sent samples of some of our silk materials up on the, uh, on the instrument package to, uh, to look to see what uh, 
what type of uh, damage they would undergo while they're up there. Uh, some of them ended up undergoing too much damage because a meteorite hit the package and uh, knocked a corner off and all of our silk <laughs> materials from Oxford were gone because they were in that corner. But we had materials from other places like Tufts, so we still got some back. Um, looking at grown to order, uh, we're very interested in shape and uh, also interested in looking at these as structural materials. So anyway, we're looking at proving informants, shape, and uh, we're very much interested in composites. We haven't done as much in composites yet because we've been spending most of our time studying the material itself and, and we're moving more now into composites. Okay, and so uh, this next series of slides I bring up because in this case, what I'm trying to point out is the collaboration that's going on between the university labs and uh, the Air Force Research Lab. And so this is David Kaplan. He's at Tufts University. Uh, some of you may know him because he's actually on the Science Advisory Board before. Uh, he is one of the uh, world's experts in silk. And uh, uh, he's looking at uh, electrogelation in this, in this latest uh, uh, grant. So the silk's been around long enough to have two grant cycles. And so he's looking at uh, effects of electric fields uh, and what, what it's doing to the structure, the morphology, the behavior. You'll see on the next slide when I show you that uh, there's a lot of little tweaks that he has, uh, you know, handles available to look at different things on the, on the material. The bottom line is everything is built on looking at insights into the mechanism. The other thing that he's doing is uh, He's very much into uh, trying to make an artificial silk. And so he's been working on the gene aspect of this, transferring it to, a, um, uh, to uh, E. coli to try to make silk. Because uh, I guess to, to understand why, you have to know that silk is a very difficult thing to uh, process because spiders cannot be farmed since they will eat each other if you get them too close. And so you can farm uh, uh, the worms, the uh, silk worms. The only thing is, on another program they have at Oxford University, they found that actually the silk worms that are used for the standard silk that you find in, uh, in China and India uh, is actually made from a domesticated worm. It's, uh, we always thought at first that the silk worms have different material properties than the spider because they were natural. In actual fact, we found now that from all the other silkworms that we found in Africa and other places, they're actually more like spider silk. And that the silk that's used in industry is actually, the Bombex Mori, is actually an aberration. It's been so domesticated that the process of domestication has changed its genetic makeup and the properties now are different than what we would desire. And so uh, he's trying to bring the gene in. They're highly repetitive and so they end up undergoing truncation or some other method of gene loss and we end up only getting about two-thirds of the gene at the most and the highest amount has been uh, with Randy Lewis at uh, Utah State. So uh, uh, that's what he's been working on and that technology has actually been transitioned uh, and I'll talk about that in the next slide but here's all the handles he has available to him. These are the control variables. So he can look at the pH, viscosity, the shear, the concentration, water content, crystallinity, electrofield, and, uh, and the deposition process. Uh, and that's because uh, you can look at those same things with the, uh, with the silk that you get from the animal. Uh, right here is the, uh, is the process for the animal where you have the spinneret here. Most of the action happens right at the end of that thing. Uh, so what he's done is looked at either genetically engineered silk or looked at uh, solubilized reprocessed silk. The biggest problem we have to reprocess silk is that you have to unfold the protein because of the sericin. There's sericin associated with the silkworms and you have to get rid of it. And so when you essentially uh, go through that process and you reprocess the silk, you end up losing some of the mechanical properties. And that's again why spider silk is so much more desirable because uh, you don't have to worry about it. It doesn't have any sericin because it's not sitting around anywhere. The spider doesn't keep the, worm, uh, the, um, the web up that long. 
If it doesn't ca start catching prey, it eats the web and moves on. And so uh, uh, with the worm, that's not the case. And so this has been transitioned into uh, Rajesh Naik's uh, uh, lab group, and he's at AFRL RX, and he's been working uh, a number of years now with, uh, with Dave Kaplan. And what his interest is in uh, is enzyme stabilization. And uh, he's been working on enzyme stabilization in uh, uh, silicon materials. And he worked with the Tyndall folks down in uh, Florida and uh, with that. And now he's trying to use uh, the silk uh, fiber and films to entrap the enzyme. And why would he want to do that? Well, silk has large hydrophobic domains and small hydrophilic spacers. This, uh, in turn, also depending upon what uh, amount of crystallinity you add to the silk, you can have uh, greater or lesser content of beta sheets. Uh, there's also less organized, uh, flexible domains. Uh, they all help to stabilize the enzyme within the structure. And so what he tried stabilizing is the organophosphate hydrolase, and it turns out that enzyme can uh, hydrolyze uh, nerve agents. And so uh, he's incorporated that into uh, silk, and he's made a film. And, and in fact, silk films are this clear. Uh, the transmittance through a silk film is uh, pretty high. It's uh, very high 90s. And so here's some of the examples of the stability he's been able to get of the enzyme in the silk. Uh, this is silk, or this is the enzyme without silk, so it's just the enzyme in water. And this is the enzyme in the silk. And uh, this is being exposed to UV radiation. You can see this is temperature. So the higher the temperature, the easier it is for this to be denatured. And then the same with detergents. You can denature it with detergents. And again, this is within the silk. And in every case, you can see that you get uh, a higher stability by using the, uh, the silk. The question is exactly what's going on there. And so they're going to have to, to look at that. But in the meantime, uh, what I wanted to uh, point out is, is they're also working in it with another uh, TD, uh, which is AFRL-RH, uh, which is the uh, human effectiveness branch, or uh, uh, TD. And uh, they're looking at taking these uh, silk uh, enzyme films and using uh, George Whiteside's uh, uh, paper uh, uh, microfluidics that he developed at Harvard and essentially trying to use these in a ditcher project to, uh, to measure for uh, chemical agents. And uh, uh, right now their uh, LOD within these silk films are down to 25 uh, micromolar. But uh, this has been working actually very well. Uh, I, I like this effort because of the the various uh, interactions that are going on. This is not a unique case. Uh, even with another uh, center of excellence we have with between us and an RSA, there is a strong collaboration with uh, AFRL RX that again has this same type of thing going on, including personnel transfers. So uh, that was the important point in that particular uh, research. And the third area is natural and synthetic interfaces, what I used to call the biointerfacial sciences. And here I'm looking at biotic-biotic interfaces or biotic-abiotic interfaces. This uh, sort of incorporated most of the sensor work, looking at, yes, you can get something to bind. How do you get the signal out into a silico environment? Uh, all the bio-nanotechnology, bio-meso technology uh, is within this section. and. Uh, all the self-assembly and directed assembly work is here as well. And uh, we're looking at uh, biocatalysts. We're looking at sensors that can last in extreme environments. Uh, and uh, uh, I have efforts in bio-optics, uh, and I'm doing the, uh, the bio-optics work in conjunction with, uh, with Pomeranke. And of course, the relevance is in nanofabrication, uh, looking at constraints on design and and production. And so this is, this is really cool. I mean, I, <laughs> I hope you find it that way too. This is actually a pretty interesting project. Um, 
This is called, uh, this is a new MIRI. It's called uh, Bioprogrammable 1, 2, 3, uh, DD, uh, three dimensional materials. And this one's actually done by Chad Merkin. And uh, at least he's the lead of the team. Uh, Wynn, who generally does all of the synthetic chemistry, Rossi, who does all of the peptide, and uh, Merkin, who does the DNA, uh, are involved in the uh, small scale DNA peptides. We have these metamaterial arrays involved. Uh, uh, Atwater, uh, Merkin, and then uh, as the theoretical part, uh, George Schatz. Uh, here's uh, uh, the people who are looking at these uh, designs down here. That's sh uh, Schatz again is that leading uh, that one as well. Uh, Rossi again is giving the material from the uh, peptides and Merkin is from the DNA. And then of course there's x-ray. They're looking at the x-ray of all of these to show uh, the response of the supermolecular assemblies. So these are uh, made out of DNA and, uh, or peptides and nanoparticles, but they're giving you x-rays like atomic lattices. Okay. And so to start out, I wanted to mention that the key hypothesis uh, of this DNA programmed assembly is that we're looking at thermodynamics. This is a thermodynamic minima, not kinetic. Because it turns out you can achieve a kinetic minima, such as with uh, hexagonal close pack, but then uh, if you anneal it and uh, it sits for a couple hours, it will, it will go into face center cubic. So uh, it's not the uh, thermodynamic minima. So that's what we're actually looking at is thermodynamic minima. And so in developing these, he's, he's come up with five rules of how you can assemble these. And the first rule is that particles of equal hydrodynamic radius will maximize complementary nearest neighbors. And so the hydrodynamic radius is the particle and all of the DNA linkers that are around the outside of it. Okay? And so if you have all of your DNA be self-complementary, which means that uh, uh, the DNA from this particle and the DNA from this particle are identical and they're complementary so they will bind to each other, then you'll get this face center cubic. And if you have two particles that have the same hydrodynamic radius but the DNA actually are not self-complementary, so this darker blue will not match with, or excuse me, this darker blue is just like this green, so it will self-complement and bind to each other, but this gray one won't. This gray one has uh, DNA on it that is complementary to the strands on the dark blue, but it is not complementary to itself. And so, the, so therefore, in the thermodynamic uh, structure, it would want to have as many nearest neighbors as possible, and to achieve that, you would get a body center cubic. Okay. And so, if you look at these, these are the, the uh, TEMs, and you can see that on, on all of these. This one actually gives you face center cubic, and this one gives you body center cubic. And there's the x-ray uh, analysis to confirm that. OK, the next one. Rule two, the overall hydrodynamic radius of the DNA nanoparticle, although I think he calls them spherical, uh, uh, spherical nucleic acids now, uh, dictates its assembly and packing behavior. And so again, uh, uh, it all depends on the size. I think that's, there you go. That's the hydrodynamic radius, okay? So this is the structure you get if they're the equal, right? But now, if you change the particle on the inside, make this one smaller than this one, but the hydrodynamic radius is the same, you get the same structure, okay? Because it's, it's built around the hydrodynamic radius, not the particle radius. Because Frankly, it doesn't care what the particle is. That's the really fascinating part about this, is that the x-ray, uh, the, the structures you're getting, it doesn't care if this is gold, it doesn't care if this is platinum, it doesn't care if it's uh, anything. I mean, it's, it just cares about the hydrodynamic radius. And so it's really fascinating that you're getting these properties uh, just by throwing these uh, particles together with the DNA. And so again, all of these are different size, okay? They all show the same structure because the hydrodynamic radius 
is equal. Okay, and here, here is a TEM of them. You can see the little dots in the middle here. And right there's a better one showing you how these, uh, and those scale bars are all 50 nanometer, by the way. Okay, number three, particle hydrodynamic uh, size ratio and DNA linker ratio dictate the thermodynamically favored structure. So these are the different hydrodynamic radiuses, and the ratio is this one to this one, and then with the linkers, it would be the ratio of this one to this one, so to speak. Uh, and it's also the number of linkers per particle. And uh, here you've got a uh, hydrodynamic ratio of 0.64, of this particle to this particle, and you end up with this aluminum uh, B2. So it doesn't matter how big they are, if you can keep those ratios the same, you will get uh, AlB2. Uh, the same with uh, this one, uh, 0.37 and 2, you will get this uh, uh, chromium-3 uh, silicon. And uh, in this case, uh, this is an odd one, if you have ratios like this, you'll get cesium-6 C60. It looks just like cesium-6 C60 in an x-ray. And here's the, uh, here's the x-rays of them, and here's the, the particles assembled with the uh, other particles inside. You can see they're all assembled the way they, they should be. And then if you vary, notice you vary the size of the particles, okay and you see these, they're all the same size here, for the, but the particles themselves are different. That comes to rule four. Two systems with the same hydrodynamic size ratio and linker ratio exhibit the same thermodynamic product. And so it didn't matter that I shrink them, as long as I keep the ratio the same, I will always have cesium chloride. The same with this one, this one, and this one. And, uh, it turns out that I actually have regions then where if you look at the DNA linker ratio and the size ratio, if you're within this region of, of the linker and size, you'll always get a BCC, which is the cesium chloride structure. And again, if you're within this one, you get this structure and that one. And here's the ones that they've made so far. And uh, so far, it's pretty accurate. This one's on the edge, uh, which actually comes out x-ray wise to be the purple one. Uh, this red one's kind of odd because it's up here, but it really has this structure. So there are some uh, oddities they haven't been able to explain yet, but overall it's been working pretty well. Although this is a new project, it's only been working about uh, four months, so uh, <laughs> they have a lot to, to tweak on it. And then the last rule, the most stable crystal will maximize all type, uh, possible types of DNA sequence specific hybridization actions. And in this case, what you're doing is you're putting different linkers on here. So the blue has this linker and this linker. And the red only has linkers for this blue. So the blues can attach to each other, but the red can only attach between the blues. Okay? And by doing that, you can actually achieve the simple cubic or uh, sodium chloride structure. Okay? All right. So these are all of the the different materials by design that they've done so far as far as structures. The only other thing I wanted to look at is, is the actual nanoparticle itself. Oh, I had one other thing. That's right, I forgot about this. This is the hollow spacer. You know, one of the things you can do is, uh, since you're assembling these, you could actually put a hollow spacer in here to extend these structures. And so the way you do a hollow spacer is you, you, you just take a regular, uh, nanoparticle with DNA on it, but you've got uh, alkynes here at the, near the surface, and you cross-link those, and then you dissolve out with base the, uh, the metal so that you have a hollow sphere. And those hollow spheres don't show up in the x-ray. And so when you look at these, you can take a BCC structure and essentially make a hollow sphere in the middle, and now it shows up in the x-ray as a simple cubic. Or you could take this uh, ALB2 structure and pull out the bottom, and now you have a simple hexagonal. And in this case, this one would be a thermodynamic structure as opposed to the kinetic one. Uh, this one looks like graphene when you take out all of these red ones and leave the blue ones. And if you take this cesium-6 C60 structure, you could either end up with the BCC or they actually don't have a complementary structure for what does C60 look by itself in here. And so they called it lattice X. Your other option was to replace the nanoparticles with other particles, 
such as prisms. Uh, you can replace it with the rods, uh, uh, orthorhombic or uh, uh, octahedral. And uh, these line up, the prisms line up linearly, so you end up getting these structures. The, with the rods, you end up getting these uh, structures here. Uh, again, with these, you get face-centered cubic, and with these, you get body-centered cubic. And so, again, that's the, uh, the x-ray. So I thought that was fascinating. So I thought uh, that was a pretty good uh, start to the, uh, to the MIRI. Finally, the last area is the extreme files. And again, uh, I mentioned that we're looking at trying to incorporate things in extreme files into existing systems, trying to make them uh, resist uh, extreme uh, environments. We're looking at new catalysts, sensors, and as materials. And uh, these are the last uh, couple of uh, slides. Uh, with Doug Clark, the reason I bring this one up is because this is an example where you pay somebody to do something, and, uh, and then after uh, looking at it, you discover that the science is moving you in a different direction. And so this one was a thermal zine project. He was looking at a thermally resistant enzyme, and uh, he ended up uh, showing us uh, some filaments that were in the uh, organism. And uh, we got so fascinated with the, uh, the filaments that we wanted him to grow materials off the filaments. And that has since evolved into actually trying to grow structures such as these using the components of those filaments. And so here's what the filaments look like. These are found in volcanic vents. And uh, this is the structure of the filaments. And essentially, he's isolated the monomer, which forms this dimer, and then you can make the filaments. And uh, all he's done so far with this particular one is he's, he's got it uh, built and put in the bacillus subtilis, and he's expressing the, the gamma uh, prefoldin. And eventually what he wants to do is form these into these controlled assembly structures. And so that's the end of that project, and I'll end with this transition slide. So. I'll leave that up so you can look at it. Otherwise, uh, do you have any questions? Yes. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot. I'm also the question person. <laughs> so I see you're working on structural materials, sensor materials, and biocatalysts, but you're not doing anything in actuation. In actuation materials or, or muscle-like actuation, which is key for really biorobotics, microrobotics, a lot of other things is to have, you want, you want to have a spectrum of multifunctional materials that includes actuation. So my question is, why aren't you in? You well, because I, I am, <laughs> <laughs> I am, but I didn't include it. That's my new uh, BRI with uh, Les Lee. We've got a, uh, an actuator uh, uh, materials BRI and, and since it just happened, we haven't even gotten you know, we're, we're now getting proposals for that. So uh, uh, maybe you gotta do this. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't done as much on that one yet. But. <laughs> what, what, what did you ask for? Uh, huh? What did you ask for? For the proposals? Yeah. Um, it was a uh, composite one. Uh, I can't remember exactly which actuator was involved in that. We also have a MURI, actually, out in uh, Stanford. I forgot about that. Uh, looking at actuators as well for sensors. Um, Les, you here? Yeah, he's oh, he's homesick? He would have been able to explain. I'll have to get back to you about it. It's actually out now, though. The BAA should be out already. Yes? Uh, oh. It's hard to multifunction. I know. <laughs> yeah. um, first of all, the stuff it really is way cool. And th there's such an interesting range of possible things uh, that you could be doing. I was wondering, do you have in hand the equivalent of a list of the five or ten really hard things in material sciences that we find doing with synthetic systems that helps you engender, you know, what's the highest priority to work for, look for in the natural world? Are there, it's a list of things that we just find really hard to do with, uh, with metals and other materials we, we craft ourselves that are necessary for the Air Force that help you pick and choose among the, the huge universe of fascinating things you could be doing. I should turn this off. I can't get it to close. Well, what we mainly focus on in this program has been on uh, functional materials. And so uh, we have fun uh, focused less on the structural material aspect. And so 
we're focused on how do we build more capability into a material. Uh, I've been trying to look less at uh, just trying to replace a material that's out there now and bringing in uh, a biomaterial to do the same thing. And so, I guess I don't have a list that I have written down that I do it. I think it was, we mainly just sit down, have a discussion with the lab personnel, and uh, talk about what their problems are, and uh, how we could possibly do it from the uh, structures that we know of versus what it is we can't do, and maybe we can go out there and try to engineer things to do. You early you, sh you showed an example of um, uh, biostructure and vi the visual properties. Mm -hmm. um, are you also looking at the non-visible properties, a no. as as is evident in nature? You mean like so so, so bu bugs? Some bugs, right, mate, and they show not visible, right? But but uh, but you know IR and or other frequencies, oh, yes. right? They, they 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 project those to one another. Um, they're used as a signaling mechanism. So, so my yeah. question is, are you looking at synthesis? You know, the example you gave was, was in the visible spectrum. I'm just curious if you're looking at it. Obviously, it could be useful for a variety of military applications like covert channels, but also detection in terms of defense. Yes. We, we, in fact, uh, over the life of the program, we've worked with mainly IR. Uh, we have looked at UV as well. And we still have an interest in that area. And so we're pushing the envelope. One of the things that I had last year was on the chromophores is to try to approach that from a genetic engineering point of view and also a discovery point of view to try to engineer the materials to push them out into the IR or the UV. Uh, we've been pretty successful on the uh, IR. The UV has been tougher. Uh, and then uh, we've also been going after discovery, just going out into nature and then examining what we found. Well, we've gotten so many organisms now, such as we have some now that work without oxygen. And so that would be very interesting to use some of these materials where you, you don't have oxygen available. You're trying to seal, say, the case. Then, uh, uh, but we haven't gotten all the biochemistry down on that yet. Yeah. So. I, guess, I guess I should end this. <laughs> so I'm cutting myself off. Because uh, uh, we've run out of time, so I'm going to have to uh, instead uh, move on.